Okay, uh, thanks for uh, coming to my talk. So uh, what I wanted to do today is to share some field experiences from uh, uh, our customers that are involved in uh, various projects around uh, the cloud with Kafka and building a bridge to the cloud. So I get to travel around Europe, talk to customers so, uh, about these things and I wanted to share some of the, uh, some of the uh, reasons why they're doing this and some of the considerations around how to build this bridge and um, share them with you and uh, also take a look at some of the, uh, some of the uh, detailed components that are involved in building a successful bridge to the cloud and a successful bridge to the cloud project. So we're going to cover some of the drivers behind this. Why are, customers do why are our customers doing this? Uh, we're going to look at uh, the bridge, the component that is the bridge, which is a component that Confluent has called Replicator. And uh, the bridge will then land in Confluent Cloud, which will be the, uh, the cloud component that we'll be uh, talking about here. And there's going to be an overview of that in terms of what are the connectivity options and uh, what are the security concerns around building a bridge to the cloud and what are we seeing here in terms of what's actually being done and uh, how customers are, are uh, dealing with some of these challenges. And once we've gone through that, I'm going to check, uh, take you through a little bit of uh, deployment considerations. How, what are the things you need to think about when, uh, when you're building a bridge like this? So, why are customers doing this? Uh, there's no um, news to us that there's a great cloud shift going on, uh, driven by competition or that we want to deliver a better service to our customers or that we have a, a huge uh, digitization movement going on. Most of the times, uh, customers try to choose a use case uh, that is well suited to the cloud. So the selection of the use case they start the cloud migration with is important. And sometimes that application of that use case can live independently in the cloud. But very often, there's a requirement to get the data that you have on-prem into the cloud to use for that application or in that use case. So uh, it's very, very uh, uh, seldom that we see that, uh, that customers do a great lift and shift, but they do a use case by use case, application by application migration. That is how, how we see some of the successful migration projects out there. And at the core of this, of course, is uh, the, the data migration strategy. I mean, we have a, a cloud strategy. We're going to be cloud first. But we also need our data. And it's very rare, like I said, that the uh, application or the use case can live independently in the cloud. Normally, it needs some data that we have on-prem sitting in some systems. And it's, a, it's a, quite a fallacy to believe that this is one time thing. What we see is that customers do this uh, very gradually. And they realize that we're going to have some uh, on-prem systems that we are not able to move to the cloud in the foreseeable future. Some systems, I would argue, will st stay there forever. So you need to be prepared to live in a hybrid environment for a very, very long time. But we also need to get the data liberated in those systems that they're locked into now, be it mainframes or, or databases or whatever legacy systems, and get them into the cloud so we can start deploying these uh, new use cases and, and uh, use the ecosystems uh, out in the cloud. So in reality, these things also become bi-directional because once we liberate the data from the on-prem, put it into the cloud, our developers start doing cool things with the data, we'll create new, more valuable data. And mo many times that data is then needed back on the prem again because we have applications and use cases that require that data to be used on-prem. So these things become uh, uh, bi-directional and uh, they're also uh, a need for and a, a strategy like this to be very aware of that we're talking about very complex, intricate uh, systems that we have on-prem that are very dependent on each other. So we, we need to move them in a slow and a controlled fashion. And like I said, we need to be able to accept that these systems, uh, we're gonna have a hybrid environment for a very long time, potentially uh, forever. 
Uh, but liberating the data is at the core of these projects that we are in well involved in. So getting the data off of their uh, existing systems and into these more modern data management systems or data systems in the cloud. So if we go one step deeper and look at wh what are the customers telling us why they're doing this, apart from the overall strategy of cloud first, etc., there's a few things that we keep hearing. And uh, the first one is we need to deploy new use cases. So now we have access to these ecosystems and these services in the cloud that we didn't have before. Uh, we might have had use cases previously that we couldn't deploy because they were not viable from an economic perspective or for resource uh, reasons. So now we can deploy those. So that's probably the, the most uh, important driver. The second one we hear is developer velocity. Developers need to do more and more, faster and faster. So that's an important thing. The other side of this is that a lot of our customers say that we also need to have, be able to uh, allow or offer our developers um, an environment that is fast and that allows access to these ecosystems. Otherwise, we can't, we can't attain and retain the talent we need if we are a, a slow organization with uh, no access to these ecosystems that they're used to or that they want to be using to provide these new types of services. So that's an important one. And that goes hand in hand with access to the ecosystems. All developers that come from the, I mean, the younger generations coming out now, they're used to being uh, heavily integrated and using these ecosystems in the cloud. So we need to be able to, to access them uh, using our on-prem data to deploy new use cases in these ecosystems. Of course, we have the cost optimization uh, piece here. It's always uh, an important factor. It plays into this whole play. Now we have access to modern data systems that we might not have been able to, to use before previously on-prem. And the last one we're seeing more and more actually is kind of an interesting one, and that is mobility. So customers say, we don't want to lock in to one vendor or one cloud provider or one technology or one, one service or one ecosystem. If we are unhappy, we want to be able to take our data and move it somewhere else. And we're not saying that we provide a solution for that, like a silver bullet solution for that, but customers are starting to ask for this as a characteristic of whatever they decide to go with. So having a mobility piece or a mobility characteristics of the solution you deploy is starting to get more and more important. A lot of customers have dual or multi-cloud strategies. That plays in there as well, but the mobility piece is coming up more and more. So those are some of the uh, drivers that we hear about from our customers why they're doing this. And the way we go about this at Confident is that we use something called the Confident Replicator, which is a technical component that acts as a bridge between uh, Kafka environments. So you can replicate data and configuration across multiple uh, Kafka domains. They can be multiple on-prems, they can be on-prem to, uh, to cloud, and as we said, a lot of times there are requirements to do this bi-directionally. Then you have cloud to cloud and then cloud back to the on-prem. So it's a bi-directional approach. It allows you to copy both, uh, both the, the actual data, but also the configuration on the topic level between these different environments. Um, as I mentioned, it doesn't have to be that the data center is always the, the or the on-prem is always where you start your, your, your uh, the project. Some of our customers actually think of the cloud as their first premise, and then their on-premise sites hang off of the cloud. So they have turned that model around. And then it's important that a component like this, the replicator, can act in, in both directions. Because if we look at the complexity we've created in most of our data systems over time, is that we have a lot of point-to-point -point links inside our, our data centers, and then across data centers, across clouds, and multiple regions in the cloud. So we're just um, creating these complexities of, of, uh, of, of these point-to-point -point links using um, you know, APIs and whatnot. So the idea with uh, something like Kafka, like an event streaming platform, is to do the decoupling of the, of, the, uh, of the different systems. Liberate the data, decouple the systems, and connect them all to this common streaming platform, which is the data pipeline for your different microservices and whatnot. So the role that the replicator can play in these environments is to bridge between these environments because you'll have different administrative or security domains that you can't just say, yeah, let's have one big um, 
Kafka cluster that stretches the whole world, the whole organization. That's a nirvana that is very seldom something we see, especially not in legacy organizations. So you might have you know, Kafka clusters or Confluent uh, platform clusters deployed on-prem, or you might, you might have them uh, self-managed in various cloud providers. And the replicator can then bridge the data between these two, these different environments to make sure that the data is available both on-prem and off-prem in the various clouds. So that's the role that we believe that the replicator can play. So the, the local clusters, they take care of the decoupling and liberating the data, because you can use then Kafka Connect connectors to bring in data from third-party systems like databases, and mainframes, whatnot. Once it's in, in, in the Kafka cluster or a Confluent cluster, you can then start replicating it across clusters, across these administrative domains, be it different uh, business divisions, different companies you acquire, or just different clouds and different security domains. Because one question we always get is that, okay, uh, it's fine, but I know that my connectors could actually talk straight to the cloud. Why not just say, let's connect our, our, our uh, database here using Kafka Connect and send the data straight into the destination without you know, skipping the replicator? And there's various reasons for this that you uh, can discuss around, okay, is this a good idea or not? I mean, we have all the security concerns. We have the concerns about latency and performance going over the WAN or even the internet. And we have things like back pressure and various uh, but there's other uh, concerns that maybe it's a better idea to get the data to the, the, the closest local cluster that you have inside of the administrative domain, get the data there, and then you start the asynchronous replication between the different environments. So usually this comes down to discussion around security, administrative domains, sometimes performance. But usually uh, the administrative domains and the different uh, the different uh, uh, de defined architectures like a security domain is what dictates uh, the, the, the architecture here. So what we're trying to build here is to say, okay, well, let's build a streaming platform that covers, that uh, decouples our systems, liberates our data, and can live on-prem, off-prem, self-managed, or fully managed in the cloud, and across its different cloud providers. That's, that's where we believe that the, the uh, Replicator can play in this this easy little ecosystem here, this Kafka Confluent ecosystem. So that's kind of the idea of uh, of uh, where the replicator fits in here. So how, how many have heard about Confluent Cloud? Hands up. Oh, six, seven. Okay. So because now we talked about the bridge and what the role of the replicator is as a bridge. What we're going to land the bridge in for the purpose of this talk is Confluent Cloud. So it's basically a fully managed Kafka service. So we, <coughs> we at Confluent will then run the brokers and all the components for you. You just need to relate to your topics and your data and your clients. The rest is managed by us. So it's a standard Kafka platform for, for all purposes. So any existing components that you might have, self-managed on-prem, or existing applications that you've written towards open source Kafka will work against uh, Confluent Cloud because it's standard Kafka. Just some uh, <clears throat> base facts around, uh, around Confluent Cloud then. So it's available on all three major cloud providers. Uh, it will run in our account or our subscription, so it's a SaaS model. We're not installing and uh, provisioning something inside of your environment. We will run it in our environment and we'll provide the connectivity options for you to consume it as a SaaS service. Um, it's available through uh, GCP and Azure marketplaces. So if you, have a, if, you have, if you need or want to transact through one of those, pro those providers, you can do that and, and use the spend, the committed spend you have on those services to draw down against Confluent services as well. And the integration will be also, in a, in a phased approach, and uh, in the early next year, we will have also a portal integration. So you'll do management and configuration from uh, these cloud providers' own consoles, their, uh, their existing uh, uh, UIs. And then, as options, you have multiple options, depending on your requirements on the platform. Do you want to do pay-as-you-go, or do you want to do committed spend? So there's options for that. You can have a shared or dedicated environment. So if you have regulatory requirements on separation for data, then you can get dedicated clusters for just you. 
we're happy to run on uh, on shared environment for dev environments, etc., we have that as an option as well. We have both private and public connectivity options, and we'll talk more about those because those are uh, important when it comes to uh, deciding on how and, and where to place the bridge. So we can do uh, VPC peering and provide uh, private networking options as well, depending on your requirements. Uh, we have multi-availability zones, so depending on your liability requirements, uh, the default is that we replicate data across three ACs to make sure that we, uh, we have multiple copies of the data. And we have different support options, ranging from basic developer support uh, actually, there's actually a free option as well, where you have community-based support all the way to a premier support with on with uh, on-premise uh, resident architectures, uh, resident architects as well. So depending on requirements, there's different options there. And we also throw in uh, the the uh, uh, licenses for the other Confluent IP that we have, which includes the replicator. So even if you're uh, Confluent Cloud customer, you still have access to the licenses to run some of the on-prem self-managed components like Replicator included in the license. So why are we doing this? Uh, we think actually it's a pretty sweet deal because Kafka is a pretty ad complex system and it uh, requires a fair amount of skill to run and finding people who know Kafka and know how to operate it at scale for missing mission critical pipelines is quite expensive. So we can take that burden off for you we run it for you. Uh, we can deploy extremely fast in minutes. We can have uh, clusters up and running. And uh, there's some uh, out-of-the-box integration with the cloud services, uh, like uh, S3, GCS, uh, those types of things. And we can also give you a service level. So we can give you a 99.95% SLA with support on top of that. So it's a pretty sweet deal, so you can focus on, on de developing applications for the business rather than running your own infrastructure. And this has been around for quite some time, actually. Um, so we have some of our largest customers are running multi-gigabit, gigabyte uh, pipelines through this at very low latencies. And uh, the people who operate the service have hundreds of years of, of Kafka experience. Some of them are also, a lot of them are actually also committers to the, to the Kafka project. So we have a good amount of skill there. Uh, we provide uh, SLAs, as I mentioned and full dev cycle support and the enterprise security functions that you would expect to have in something that uh, carries your, uh, your uh, sensitive traffic in terms of authentication, encryption, and those types of things. So that was kind of a quick rundown there. Uh, in terms of connectivity options, so I have this service now. How do I consume it? How do I connect my environment to this service? You have a few options. The first one is, OK, I'm OK with having public endpoints. So basically, your Kafka clients will transact or they will connect over the internet. It will be SSL and TLS encrypted, of course, but the public, the endpoints are public, so they're available on the internet. It's straightforward and simple. And your clients can be either on-prem or in some VPC somewhere in a cloud provider. As long as there is internet access, you'll have access to your clusters. The other option is uh, for private networking. So you can do VPC or VNet peering. So if you have a requirement that it needs to be private networking, it needs to be fenced off and isolated, we can connect to your environment using VPC or VNet peering. And uh, then your clients need to be inside of the uh, environment, they need to be inside of the, the, the VPC or the VNet that we're peering with because it's going to be a private networking domain. With AWS, you also have an option to go for Transit Gateway. Transit Gateway provides you with more connectivity options, and you can also connect multiple clouds and, and drop VPNs and dedicated links from your on-prem into the Transit Gateway. So it's more like a traditional router in terms of connectivity options. So we got that option as well. So depending on your requirements, we can offer both public and private connectivity options and larger environments or larger customers who have a large cloud estate, for example, in AWS, they will be very familiar with uh, something like Transit Gateway. And there's also uh, quite common to mix these types of connectivity options. So for my dev and, and maybe my QA clusters, I have maybe uh, single, mo single availability zone uh, clusters with public internet endpoints. And then for my production environment, I'll be on uh, a, a paired environment with isolation and the private networking. It all depends on your requirements. But you can mix and match them. So where do we deploy 
the replicator then to create this bridge. If you're familiar with Kafka, Kafka has something called uh, connector. So Kafka Connect provides the ability to, to connect third-party systems both as sources and sync. So you can send data out of Kafka and, and uh, load data into Kafka. And the replicator is basically a source connector, so it will read from the source cluster and produce into the destination cluster. And that process needs to happen on some uh, device or some, some server. And usually you uh, build uh, these connect clusters with dedicated working nodes for the, for the replicator to make sure they have the, the, the required performance. So they, these systems need to be placed somewhere. So where to deploy them? Because uh, in terms of connectivity options, we saw that we had a few different connectivity options. So the considerations we have is basically, so where do I deploy it? At my source or my destination, on-prem or in the cloud? And it depends. The default recommendation is to make sure that you have the replicator as close as possible to the destination to make sure you have reliable producer operations. So latency and things like that play into the picture here. But with the cloud, usually what we see at customers is that you end up deploying in the most secure zone because you have firewall and connectivity issues. Most security teams will not allow you to create inbound connections from the cloud to the on-prem, for example. They want outbound connections. And even though you can, might have a discussion on performance and whatnot, usually the security guys have a very heavy, uh, their, their say is a very, uh, carries a lot of weight. So what we're seeing is that in most of the times you end up deploying the replicator in the most secure zone, even if it's suboptimal from a Kafka perspective, just because of security implications. And actually, the same thing is true for the bi-directional use case. So if you want to send data back from the cloud to the on-prem, we end up pulling the data down from the cloud by, rep by having the replicator still being sitting on the on-prem. So a couple of scenarios here. So if I have an environment where I say, OK, I want to replicate my data from the on-prem to the cloud using public endpoints, Simple and straightforward. I, rep I, I place my replicator on-prem, get the data from my local uh, Kafka cluster, and I send it up to the cloud. It's an outbound connection, no problems with firewalls at all. If I go bi-directional, I'm going to end up usually deploying the replicator to do, it, do the replication from the cloud and back down, also inside my firewall on the on-prem to make sure that I don't violate any security rules or have the need to open firewall rules uh, from the internet all the way into my, to my, to my back end where my cluster lives. If I want to replicate from the on-prem to the cloud using transit gateway, so a little bit more advanced uh, environment, and this is kind of starting to get more and more common as uh, customers mature into this and they go with transit gateway to have more connectivity options. I can then stretch my private network domain to the on-prem I can create in this uh, bubble of private networking, and, and even though I do that, there will still be somewhere a, a more secure zone or some firewall rules or some uh, network security groups in the cloud that dictate what I am allowed to do between these different zones. So it's still very likely, even though I could place some of the, replica I mean, the replicator in the, in the cloud, it all depends on what my security team says and what we are okay with and what the connectivity options are. Uh, in this picture. If we take it one step further to the, to the cloud then and say, okay, I'm, I'm replicating from my on-prem to the cloud. I also need to do some cloud to cloud replication because I have multiple clusters or even maybe running some clusters in Azure and I want to replicate over to GCP. Then if, it's, if the endpoints are public, then everything is public. Then no, no problem here. We can just uh, deploy the replicator in the destination uh, VPC, close to the destination cluster to again adhere to the default recommendations where you should place the replicator. So that's an easy one. When we start to talk about uh, VPC peering and private networking, it becomes a little bit more complex because now I have this domain that is isolated, doesn't have any internet access. But again, if I want to get data out of there, I need to open up somewhere, right? And then usually again end up placing the replicator in the most secure zone, which will be inside the uh, VPC-paired environment, 
that will then create the necessary connectivity to be able to replicate data out of that environment into the other cloud. So even though many times you might have discussions on what is best from performance perspective, our experience is that the security team are usually the, the team that decides where this ends up because of pure security. Sometimes connectivity will be also an issue. So as long as, you, but as soon as you want to replicate data across uh, different administrative or security domains, that's where Replicator will, will help you to solve a lot of these use cases of getting the data available and replicated across, across environments. So we have, uh, we have some, I mean, we just scratched on the surface on this topic here. We can talk for many hours about how to do this in, a, in, a, in the best way. But we're around, and there's a white paper on our website touching on this as well. And for those of you who haven't tried Confluent Cloud, there's a free, free uh, option now where you can get $50 credit for the first three months to try Confluent Cloud. You can basically be up and running in, in, in five minutes. So and we, uh, we're around, we have 311 is our booth, and uh, we'd love to talk to you about your bridge to cloud or cloud projects involving Kafka. So thanks for your uh, time.